tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Soaked on the south coast, a powerful rain and windstorm causes major problems, and there's a lot more on the way also. We need security. We need more security for our kids. An emergency meeting for parents at a Vancouver elementary school where a young girl was lured away by a stranger and sexually assaulted. And... Cease operations or face court-ordered fines, jail time, or both. The B.C. Supreme Court orders illegal pot shops in Vancouver to shut down. But will they do it? This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. An emergency meeting is underway right now at a South Vancouver elementary school. That's where a young girl was lured away from the playground by a stranger and sexually assaulted. The CBC's Leanne Young is live at Sex Smith Elementary. And Leanne, parents there are demanding answers, aren't they? They absolutely are, Anita, and tonight that is what this meeting was about. It's actually just wrapped up minutes ago. The school's right behind me. If you can see, there are parents uh, just streaming out of the school right now, and dozens of them turned out to this meeting today. It started at 5 p.m., and it was standing room only inside this library. All of them very concerned, of course, after a six-year-old girl was lured away from the playground while she was outside and then sexually assaulted nearby and then brought back to the school. So the incident happened last Wednesday, and it's been about 20 24 hours since parents have heard about it and I had a chance to speak with some of them shortly before they stepped into this meeting. Here's how some of them were still feeling. Oh, I'm feeling like I'm so scared. Unbelievable, can't believe that because it shouldn't happen like it's a school area, right? We just moved from Manitoba, so it's a new place for us, so it's kind of scary. So I feel like the supervision, they need to have a, like a strong supervision. Also, they need to provide cameras outside. Uh, just to install some cams so they can watch uh, what's happening here. Now, as you heard some of those parents say, they want to see more cameras on school grounds. They want more supervision for the kids. They want to have more screening procedures when they when strangers turn up to the office. So a number of suggestions. Those were things that were brought forward during this meeting today. And I'm told at this meeting, the school principal was there addressing the parents as well as Vancouver school board members and parents out of the meeting came and told me they said that the VSB was open to their suggestions, but they didn't get a lot of clarity as to what the action items were moving forward. And most of all, they're still very upset that they weren't told about this incident sooner. A week after it happened, they say it's just far too late. And VPD have said that there were some tie-ups with the uh, reporting of this incident. That's why it was told later, but uh, parents say they should have been warned. Vancouver police, of course, now are searching for a suspect. He's described as a darker-skinned male, around 30 years old. He had either gray or brown hair, and he was wearing gray pants and Vancouver police also very interested in dash cam footage so anybody who's got footage between 8 30 a.m. and 2 30 p.m. from last Wednesday December 5th are asked to contact Crime Stoppers. Anita? Our Leanne Young in Vancouver. Thank you Leanne. Well, the relentless downpour was and still is tonight a major headache for Metro Vancouver commuters. Drivers and pedestrians dealing with heavy rains and strong winds. Video shared online offers some sense of the chaotic commute. In Burnaby, waters lapped the doors on SUVs and splashed across front windshields. Pooling water also seen in North Vancouver. Frustration for commuters trying to get to work and tonight for those trying to get home. The CBC's Tina Lovegreen has more. When it rains, it pours. And that's especially true for Elizabeth Balugan. She's been tirelessly mopping up for the past three days. Every time it rains, this is what we do. And has been forced to pick up the chairs and shut down her restaurant. How am I going to do? I can't open the business. I can't. I don't know how long I'm going to be closed for now. She's called her landlord for help, but she says no one has come by to find the source of the problem or to try to find a solution. I'm losing customers. I'm losing business. I have skipped the dishes. I can't even do anything with the skip the dishes. They've been calling me to order food. And she's not alone when it comes to her frustrations with the rain. The roads were a mess, with some drivers getting stranded on pooling streets. Still Creek behind me here has overflown into the McDonald's parking lot, causing it to shut down one of the entranceways and also to shut down several other streets in the area. 
and the parking lots in the area began to look more like lagoons, with wildlife making themselves at home. Transit goers didn't have it any easier. The Millennium Line is facing all day delays for those going between Commercial Broadway and VCC Clark. Passengers have to transfer to a shuttle train at Commercial after an overnight landslide pushed mud and debris onto the SkyTrain track. So BC drivers are urged to slow down and with 90 millimeters forecasted to fall by tomorrow and plenty of snow higher up, it's not likely the frustration will ease, especially if your business is on the line. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, Burnaby. Well, Mike and I went outside today for, what was it, 10, 15 minutes? Yeah, about 10 minutes. It was a lunch run. I mean, it was worth it, but we got kind of soaked. Well, I should have just sent you by yourself. Sent me next time. <laughs> and meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff is outside right now, braving the rain. Joe, how is it looking? Well, I have to, uh, full disclosure, I'm under a bit of a balcony, so I am not getting soaked right now, but it is coming down across uh, most of the south coast. I want to take you up above it, though, where the rain snow line has been on the move today. These are pictures from uh, Grouse Mountain. I've seen well over a meter of snow earlier this week. In fact, uh, past few days really piling it up. Uh, on the top of the locals but we did see things change over brief briefly to rain those rain snow at uh, rain snow line is once again rising so the rain that we saw today switching back to snow tonight you can see from these pictures visibility pretty low as we continue to see uh, I'm guessing another 15 to 30 centimeters uh, through tonight. Taking you back to the radar and things are all rain down here. Uh, starting you off though with the warnings because we have multiple across the south coast winds and rainfall. So the rainfall warnings really in effect through overnight tonight. Downtown Vancouver has already picked up 70 plus millimeters since the second deluge this week started last night around 5 p.m. We could see another 5 to 20 centimeters overnight tonight and into tomorrow morning and then the winds pick up. So it's really a one two punch uh, taking you to that radar. Now you can see still catching those bands of showers crossing into Metro Vancouver. That'll be the story through the overnight. But then the center of the storm that's ushering in that rain will actually move inland and that is what will make for a very windy Friday. I'm going to time that out and take you through to the next break between systems, which we could all use coming up. All right. Thanks very much, Joe. You're welcome. Well, Vancouver has won a big legal battle against illegal marijuana stores. A judge has now ordered dozens of those shops to close. CBC Vancouver News at 11 host Dan Burrett joins us live with more. Dan, will the shops actually shut down? Anita, Mike, that is the burning question, if you'll pardon me. Marijuana has been legal in Canada since October 17th, but the city of Vancouver filed 53 injunction applications against what were deemed illegal businesses starting more than two years ago. Some of the stores closed before the case went to court, but the city says 28 stores that took part now have to close or face fines, jail time, or both. The city never regulated the sale of product. It was around the land use and the business licensing, which is what has been um, allowed um, and set up in the new legalization framework. So um, it just affirms that we were actually on the right path and that we were using the tools within our municipal toolbox. Now, since legalization, pot shops have to get a development permit, a provincial retail license, and a new municipal business license to legally stay open. Keep in mind, no recreational pot shops have been approved in Vancouver, but the city says 14 applications for those provincially licensed pot shops are winding their way through the licensing process. Anita, Mike? All right, Dan, thanks very much. Several hundred thousand dollars worth of drugs and equipment has been seized by Surrey RCMP as part of an ongoing investigation. The bus dates back to November 29th. Officers executed search warrants for two units at a storage facility on 132nd Street and 72nd Avenue in Newton. It was there investigators found six kilograms of methamphetamine, an industrial pill press and 227 grams of phenacetacetin a painkiller often used to cut cocaine. RCMP say the quantity seized here could produce nearly four and a half million doses of the street drug. What we have right here just in the methamphetamine that is that could have potentially been on the streets today, the 60,000 doses, 60,000 people that can be harmed by those tubs. 
you know so I mean the dollar value of course it's staggering it's a huge impact um, and we're happy to make that impact on criminal organized crime but to me this is a human story RCMP have yet to make any arrests in relation to the seizure anyone with information is asked to call Surrey RCMP or Crime Stoppers its funding is far from secure, but Surrey's SkyTrain plans inch slowly down the track today. The TransLink Mayor's Council has voted to let staff proceed with planning and project development for infrastructure projects like this one. The proposed extension would see a 16-kilometer track constructed with stops up until Langley. However, questions persist about the project's actual cost. So far, $1.65 billion has been secured for the extension. The TransLink estimates... Estimates, rather, say it could cost as much as $2.9 billion. Residents of Surrey, I can assure you, I can assure everybody in this room, in overwhelming numbers, support SkyTrain over light rail. Staff will now move forward on 11 steps of pre-construction work to be completed in the next 15 months. Estimates suggest part of the extension could be up and running by 2025. Well, it's amazing what can happen if you take an old body shop in a gritty neighborhood and hand it over to artists. Yeah, two years ago, the city of Surrey did an experiment with one of its old industrial properties. Half the building was turned into a homeless shelter, and the other side was given to just about every kind of artist you can think of. Jesse Johnston has more. Don't let the barbed wire outside fool you. Inside this building is one of Surrey's few creative art spaces. This is a two and a half thousand square foot building and we're using every inch of it. The artists here at 10660 City Parkway appreciate every single one of those inches. It's all at a premium. It's easy to understand why they're so grateful. Just ask them where they worked two years ago before the city let them use this space. We were rehearsing in an empty storefront in the old Cloverdale Mall like the the one that was condemned. It's not glamorous. And light. Light is super important when you're trying to build a set. <laughs> but all the set builders, dancers, actors, and musicians who use this space don't need glamour. What they need is room to work. I think that's not just my challenge. I think it's a challenge for a lot of young artists and young people. You know, they've, they're brilliant, they have ideas, but um, where can they go to... Um, realize some of these ideas. Many hoped they'd be able to realize those ideas here. Surrey's last mayor and council planned to expand this facility. So that we could be in building and painting the, in the shop and another user group could use, could rehearse here. Because our city is a city of families. And Trouble is, Surrey's new mayor wants to cut spending. Doug McCallum says more than $135 million worth of projects, including a new arena in Cloverdale and community center in Grandview Heights, should be postponed. There would be a lot less art going on. The expansion on. of this arts hub is on the chopping block, too. Council will vote Monday night on whether to delay all those projects. My plea would be, look at the value that we bring, look at what we give back to the community from from tiny little beginnings, look what we grow. Creativity can come from anywhere, even an old auto body shop surrounded by barbed wire. But creativity needs space to grow. And in Surrey, space is hard to come by. Jesse Johnston, CBC News, Surrey. Well, a bizarre day to say the least for authorities both here in Canada and in the United States. Dozens of bomb threats have been sent to businesses demanding payments in Bitcoin, Vancouver police and the RCMP have confirmed multiple threats here in B.C. In the end, though, the RCMP decided it's all a scam. The threats came in the form of an email targeting schools, businesses, even subway stations. The impact? Lockdowns in dozens of cities, including Ottawa, Montreal, Calgary, Vancouver, Toronto and Winnipeg. Also coast to coast in the U.S., cities like San Francisco, New York, Seattle and Miami. The advice, if you do receive... One of these emails, don't pay the money, of course, and contact police. BC's Ministry of Children and Family Development is admitting responsibility for a Kelowna social worker accused of exploiting vulnerable Aboriginal teens. The province says it fired Riley Sanders last May after an investigation found 
that he'd used his position to isolate clients and de deprive them of money. The ministry is responding to a proposed B.C. Supreme Court class action lawsuit. One teen accuses Saunders of moving her from a stable home into independent living where she could get money from the government. She says Saunders then opened a joint bank account with her and stole the money. The RCMP is investigating the allegations, but no charges have been filed at this point. A North Okanagan man accused of assaulting several sex trade workers has been convicted of mischief in a separate criminal trial. Curtis Sagmon pleaded guilty to a lesser charge of mischief damaging property. In July 2017, he failed to inform a woman that there was a homemade spike belt on a road he had access to, and she drove over it, deflating her tires. The judge had it Sagmon, who has no prior criminal record, an absolute discharge, but Sagmon will remain in custody. He's accused of assaulting or threatening four sex trade workers between in 2013 and 2017. Sagmon also has connections to a property where the body of an 18-year-old woman was found in the fall of last year. No charges have been laid in that case so far, and he has not been named as a suspect. 38 charges have been laid against a man from Chilliwack and two companies over allegations of chicken abuse. The allegations stem from this undercover video recorded by a nonprofit animal advocacy group. Canada's Food Inspection Agency alleges workers unlawfully harmed chickens during an unloading or unloading process. Dwayne Duick and representatives for the companies are expected to appear in Chilliwack Court yeah, next Tuesday. Washington State Governor Jay Inslee is proposing more than a billion dollars in spending to protect critically endangered orcas in Puget Sound. Inslee outlining the proposed spending as part of his priorities for the state's upcoming budget cycle. $1.1 billion would be used to protect and restore salmon habitats, boost production at salmon hatcheries, clean up stormwater, and ease noise pollution from nearby vessels. Inslee says the fate of the state is inextricably linked to the animal survival. We share so much with the orcas. We share about the same body temperature. We share about the same heartbeat rate. We share close familial social interactions and bonds. And we share the need to defeat environmental degradation. Inslee also intends to ban whale watching of the southern resident whale population for three years. Tours could still be conducted around the other types of whales found in Washington state waters. Okay, so we had some issues earlier this week, but we are back live streaming the show on Facebook again. So head back there if that's where you'd like to watch our show, or you can go to our website and even YouTube if you want to skip the commercials. Yeah, it's Throwback Thursday for tonight's break, and it will be taking you back 20 years for a fun look at meals during the holiday season. So if you're watching online, stick around for that in just a few moments. And coming up, deeper in debt, why Vancouver has the highest debt-to-income ratio and the lurking threat for many could make it a lot worse. Once again, good evening and thanks so much for joining us online. We would like to welcome back our viewers on Facebook. Uh, very sorry for those technical problems this week. Not our fault, really, but... Well, technical problems happen, but we, we got it sorted out. <laughs> Uh, if you missed it, every Thursday's uh, commercial break from now is uh, going to be throwback themed. TBT. TBT. We'll take you for a nostalgia trip with some stories from our archives, and we got a lot of them there. Tonight, we take you back 20 years when former CBC reporter Suda Krishna introduced viewer viewers to Tofurky. No, that's not a misspelling. Tofurky is exactly what you think it is. The Tofurky itself has vegetarian Worcester sauce. Carrageenan, which is um, an Irish sea moss. It's beef flavored, it has other ingredients in. These are the tempeh drumettes. Tempeh drumettes. Yeah. The and then for the pièce de résistance. <laughs> this is the bird. The bird. <laughs> Capers sold about 40 tofurkeys over Thanksgiving. But what I want to know is what does a tofurkey look like in the wild? Does it gobble gobble or furky furky? Where does it live? Oh no, I killed it. I killed a tofurkey. There's no neck. 
<laughs> I don't no. see a neck. <clears throat> they probably use that to make the gravy. <laughs> it's mainly the vegetarian customers that come in to buy it. The non-turkey eaters. Non-turkey, would you eat it? Um, I'd prefer turkey. Of course, turkey isn't the only meat dish served up during Christmas. Mince meat, pies, and tarts are also standard fare. If you're vegetarian, don't despair. Mince meat has uh, traditionally has a lot of suet in it and, and lard in it, and we just took it out. Nobody seemed to miss it, nobody seemed to mind. All of a sudden, you've got a vegetarian Christmas product. I think they taste just like any old mince meat tart that you've ever tasted, only because it's, it's ours, it's a little better. Let me try this one. Give that one a try. Okay. That's your basic. You know, it's really good. Eating on TV is one of the cardinal sins. <laughs> you shouldn't do it, actually. It makes me look like an idiot, but this is really good. The reason why I did that bit on tofurkey is to show how inauthentic that food really is. I grew up in a vegetarian household, and on Christmas, we didn't serve any imitation meat. We served authentic vegetarian Indian cuisine. Try it. You may like it. I'm not sure he could get away with that reporting now. Maybe not. Maybe not. That looked, that's a good idea, though. I like that last one. Also very ahead of the game because tofurkey is huge now. It is. The one guy said he thinks it tasted really good, but that was 20 years ago. Now no. you, should, you should try it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go with the non-medicated, antibiotic-free, grass-fed, free-range, hugged every night, regular old turkey, I think. I'll or a turducken. Uh, oh. A turducken. <laughs> we'll be right back. I probably have the messiest desk in the entire newsroom. I am from Vancouver, born and raised. I was born and raised on a blueberry farm in Abbotsford. As the public broadcaster, I feel we represent communities and stories and people like no one else does. Vancouver City Councilors will be voting next week on a $1.5 billion budget for next year, and it could come with a pretty hefty tax hike. Justin McElroy explains why the city's taxes keep going up and up and up. 4.9%. If Vancouver City Council passes the budget as presented, it would be the biggest property tax increase the city has seen in a decade. And the mayor is on board with it. People focus on the percentage, but I always focus on the actual raw dollar figures, and that for the average average property owner that's between 40 and 100 dollars extra a year uh, which when you put it that way doesn't sound like a lot in an expensive city like Vancouver and and the 4.9 percent will allow us to do some things the citizens have asked for and it's true if passed property taxes would go up about 41 dollars for the average condo owner and about 108 dollars for the average homeowner but there's a few reasons why that sort of increase probably can't continue in the future first property taxes are low in Vancouver but they've gone up the last three years, and now there's a new local government in place. And the city's budget was a billion dollars at the start of this decade. Now it's 50% more. Part of the reason is that Vancouver now spends money on things that previously people thought were the purview of higher levels of government, things like affordable housing or the overdose crisis. Plus, the provincial government is now using the property tax on expensive homes for their own general purpose revenue. And they're also making all municipalities pay the health payroll tax, which comes from the property tax. The property tax is the only way that cities can raise large sums of money, and it's a pretty blunt instrument. It doesn't measure someone's economic activity or their income, only the perceived value of their land. So at the end of the day, whether you think the city of Vancouver should spend less or higher levels of government should spend more, the real question is whether the current taxation system used for municipalities is sustainable. Justin McElroy, CBC News, Vancouver. And if you're feeling strapped for money this holiday season, you may be in good company. A new report shows BC's biggest city is outpacing the rest of Canada in terms of debt to income levels. Data compiled by the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation shows Vancouver is the most indebted major city nationwide. Now, for every dollar of disposable income, Vancouverites owe $2.42. The CMHC warns the high ratio leaves people vulnerable to interest rate increases with some households potentially at risk of defaulting on loans. And to talk about this a little bit more, we're joined by Scott Hanna, President and CEO of the Credit Counseling Society. Scott, thanks very much for joining us. Thanks, Mike. Uh, this report uh, clearly shows that Vancouver is leading the country in terms of debt 
to income? What are you folks seeing? Well, you know, in this year we've seen an uptake in terms of the number of people coming to us for assistance. And typically when you're looking at what's been going on in the marketplace, what concerns us about this report is not only leading the nation in terms of our debt to income levels, but looking at our, our income itself. Our incomes are stagnant. The equity that we had in our homes has eroded, so many people, particularly those in the last couple of years who've become new homeowners, yeah. are now finding themselves upside down in terms of the equity they have in their home in relation to the debt. So it's a precarious position for people to be in, and I think as a result, many people are wondering, what should I be doing now to, for the future, because there's future rate hikes coming. Yeah. And are you seeing different clientele, if I can phrase it that way? We're seeing clientele that perhaps in the past we wouldn't have seen, people mm -hmm. with stable incomes, um, good jobs, but an awful lot of debt. Hmm. And what advice do you give them? Well, for a lot of those people, is to, it's about protecting yourself. How can I protect myself financially? So if individuals are carrying consumer debt, credit cards, lines of credit, developing a plan that says, with, our, with rates rising in the future, I need to reduce my consumer debt so that I'm in a better position to manage those uh, increases. If I don't have a budget in place today, I need to get one in place so I'm getting the best value for the income that I have and looking for opportunities to reduce our income, reacquaint ourselves with our savings account. If we don't have an emergency savings account, get one in place so that when life events happen, and they always happen at the worst time, yeah. you can manage them. And uh, you alluded to the housing situation here. Is that what really drives it for a lot of people, especially people who maybe just are getting into the market and it's like, what? wow, this is just, it's too much to bear. It is for a lot of people. I think that when house, pr when house prices were going up in value, people thought, what the heck, I just have to get in, I'll figure it out later. Now that they're not, they're saying, hmm, mm -hmm. there's nothing to figure out now. What's going to happen? I can't easily sell this home. But it's also having a trickle-down effect upon those who are renters because their rental prices are going up as well, too. And as we've heard from a lot of people, that people are finding it difficult to find manageable and reasonable rent in the lower mainland. So it has an impact on homeowners and renters. Okay, Scott, thanks very much. Appreciate Take it. Take care. Well, a message for parents and patients as hospital emergency rooms prepare to get slammed this holiday season. When you should go to the ER and when you should try to avoid it. Coming up.
Here are some of our stories that we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News at 6. The rain and windstorm that's been pounding the south coast is showing no signs of letting up tonight. From flooding to road closures, it's causing problems throughout the region. Joanna has a bit of good news in her forecast coming up. Where was your supervision at that time? Dozens of parents packed an elementary school library tonight. The police and Vancouver School Board met with them to talk about a disturbing incident. Last week, a six-year-old girl from the school was lured away by a stranger and sexually assaulted. Parents are demanding answers around how much supervision Sexsmith Elementary has during recess and lunch. Really pleased with the outcome. Uh, we see this as a victory for the city. A BC Supreme Court judge is ordering dozens of illegal marijuana shops to close their doors. 28 are still operating in Vancouver. The question, will they actually shut down? And this holiday season typically means a big spike in the number of patients making trips to BC's hospital emergency rooms. So health officials are reminding you of the other options that are available. Cold and flu season coupled with doctor's offices being closed can make for some confusion. But hospitals say you should only visit the emergency room if your life is being threatened. For example, a heart attack, stroke, overdose or trauma. If that is not the case, there are a number of new primary urgent care centers that are available. About a third of the ED visits are actually urgent, uh, but not emergent. And uh, those would be very appropriate to go to a place like the newly opened urgent primary care center. And uh, some examples would be patients that have had sprains, if they have cuts requiring sutures, asthma flare-ups that are mild to moderate. Walk-in clinics are also an option as many of them offer extended hours. Vancouver Coastal Health has a new campaign hoping to get the message out so emergency rooms do not get inundated this holiday season. And at 6.32 on this soggy Thursday evening, here's a live look down Georgia Street tonight. How much more rain can we expect in the areas that will be hit the hardest in Johanna's forecast? That's next. I'm 36 years old. No lying, right? Yeah, okay. I love to eat everything and anything. I make a mean breakfast. Jazzy eggs. I like telling stories. I'm a curious person. What better way to tell stories than journalism?
we're just silent because it's you know so what's soggy coming? out. <laughs> yeah. It was the jazzy eggs. That's You're what not excited for me to give you the forecast? Totally. The jazzy eggs threw us off. Oh, right. Yeah. Well, we're hedging because you probably have a lot of bad news. I actually... Maybe not all bad. Yeah. I tried really hard to find a silver lining in here and... I think I found one. Oh. I know. First, let me take you to the time lapse. A reminder of how gross it was. I'm using my most technical term again this morning. Uh, 70 plus millimeters since 5 p.m. last night. That was quite the dog walk, commute, just running in from the car, whatever means you were outside today for, or yes, I heard a soggy lunch from the desk as well. Uh, it was it was pretty gross out there. And we do have more rain coming tonight. We are through some of the heaviest of the rain, still looking to see more bands, as I mentioned earlier, but it's the winds that will really be our next story. Let's take a quick look at the current temperatures. Eight at YVR, 10 down towards the Southern Gulf Islands, five and through Abbotsford. So a little warmer than where we've been at the past couple of days. That's uh, why our snow levels rose up above 1,200 uh, meters through earlier today. Wind warnings in place for everyone in yellow, and that includes parts of Metro Vancouver. We're really going to see these gusts pick up tomorrow uh, mid-morning towards the afternoon and evening hours as the center of the low moves through. And I'm going to time that out for you in a moment. Meanwhile, rainfall warnings also still in place for parts of Metro Vancouver. That's really for totals close to 90 millimeters by tomorrow morning. I imagine Environment Canada will drop the rainfall warnings at latest tomorrow morning, but then round two or punch two of this system, the winds for tomorrow. Quick look at that radar again. You can see showers right across Metro Vancouver. No yellow pockets showing up on the radar, which is the heavy downpours, but we're not quite done with it yet. You can still see that fire hose pointed our way. Actually getting some good snow in through uh, central sections of the province. And a reminder again, we do have this widespread avalanche warning, public avalanche warning for basically all mountainous regions of the province. This follows our drought through the uh, most of the fall uh, and then this stormy setup over the past couple of days. And that's what's added storm snow on top of an unstable layer not really sticking well and once I show you this uh, good news on Saturday you can see why BC Avalanche is worried people will be excited to get out during this break on Saturday into the back country so heads up uh, avalanche risk is high through Saturday uh, down to a five tonight back up to a nine keeping it dry through parts of your oh, tomorrow's only Friday through parts of your Friday and into Saturday Saturday is the break though that we'll be looking for I've actually added the wind gusts on here over the next 24 hours. So pausing you at, set, pausing you at 7 a.m., you can already see some of these wind gusts picking up uh, over 50 kilometers per hour. As I take you through the day, notice some 60, 70, even 80 kilometer per hour gusts before that low swings through, bringing one last burst of rain. Most of the rain will be confined to the North Shore, but I think everyone will get it tomorrow evening as that front slides through. So here's that low one more time, sliding up from the south. That's when we see the strongest of the winds pass through tomorrow afternoon. We actually get behind it for Saturday. So this is our break day between systems, but Sunday, brand new low. Uh, good band and also good storm system. Let me take you through the next uh, seven days. Nine tomorrow, and then we come down behind that front for a dry Saturday. It's back, though, on Sunday and Monday and Tuesday. We'll see if we can find those breaks in there. I'll watch the snow levels closely. It is going to be a great weekend for whatever snow activity you're planning if you stay uh, within the bounds. Double digits early next week means snow level will be rising. But I don't think we're going to see a complete melt of everything we've accumulated. And then I leave you with the hope of a, a whole different kind of system moving in on Thursday. Hmm. So that's a week from now. Brace yourself. What Long was the name haul. of this group again? Brand New Low. Brand New I'm Low. I'm waiting for them to start playing it so you can dance. <laughs> it's, it's a bit of an indie <laughs> find, so. That's good, though. I like that. That's good. Yep. Thanks, Joe. You're welcome. Tensions are escalating between our country and China, with two Canadians now detained. Will Canada get access to both men coming up?
Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. Ever wanted to see inside our integrated newsroom? The CBC Vancouver Broadcast Centre is open for tours. Email newsroomtours at cbc.ca to book your free tour. And celebrate the holiday season with CBC with special programming on TV, radio and online. Check out the schedule at cbc.ca slash holidays. And for more from CBC Vancouver, check us out online. Tensions between Canada and China have ratcheted up to a new level. A second Canadian, as we've told you, is now being held there. Entrepreneur Michael Spavor and former diplomat Michael Kovrig were taken into custody separately on Monday. Ottawa is very concerned. China says the men are a threat to its national security. It's unclear if consular officials have been able to visit them. The arrests appear to be part of a punitive campaign by Beijing. It started just days after Huawei executive Meng Wanzhou was detained in Vancouver at the request of the U.S. Katie Simpson has more on the brewing political spat between Canada and China. Anti-Canada rhetoric is building. China's state-run media published a video editorial threatening Ottawa, saying Beijing will take revenge if the CFO of Huawei is not released. And China's ambassador to Canada wrote an editorial in the Globe and Mail, saying the Chinese impression of Canada has chilled. Beijing officially confirmed it has separately detained two Canadians on suspicion of compromising its national security. The Prime Minister says he's working to learn more about their condition. Obviously, we uh, continue to engage with uh, Chinese authorities. We uh, will uh, always be standing up for Canadians uh, in, uh, in difficult situations abroad. We're engaged uh, in uh, consular services with their families as Should well. Canadians travel to China now? Canadian travel warnings to China have not been increased, and Canada's tourism minister says she still plans to go to China next week to celebrate the year of Canada-China tourism. The government is also trying to downplay the long-term consequences of this diplomatic dispute. The former trade minister, who's now the infrastructure minister, says you can't judge a trading relationship based on a single day and that consular cases happen. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Ottawa. This diplomatic dispute is putting Canada in a difficult position caught between the United States and China. As Ellen Morrow reports, the U.S. is more focused on trade than diplomacy, even though the U.S. request was the trigger for the crisis. I've established a fantastic relationship with President Xi, who's the head of China, the absolute head of China. On Fox News today, President Trump made his priority clear, a trade deal with China. I think we're going to work a fantastic deal for both countries, but a fantastic deal for us. We're going to get China to open up. Trump wants a deal so badly that earlier this week he suggested he might intervene in the Huawei arrest, saying it could be part of the negotiations, though there's been pushback. He shouldn't really interfere in this way. He shouldn't really contaminate both processes. There shouldn't be a linkage between the trade negotiation with China and this uh, enforcement issue. It's the same sentiment coming from the Justice Department. We don't do trade, uh, and so we uh, follow the facts and we vindicate violations of U.S. law. That's what we're doing when we bring those cases, and I think it's very important for other countries to understand that. But even though it was the U.S. that started the case, China has focused its anger on Canada. What we're seeing now, which is sort of this 90-day sprint. This former member of the National Security Council's China team says that's on purpose. It's in the Chinese interest to resolve the trade war talks, and they don't want this issue to be intermingled with broader trade war discussions because it limits the likelihood that the U.S. and China will reach an accommodation. There's been a thaw in the U.S.-China trade war. China once again buying U.S. soybeans. Momentum the president does not want to lose. Tremendous amounts of soybeans. You see that already happen. The question is, will he try to leverage the Huawei arrest as part of his trade efforts, or was it just a one-time comment from President Trump? Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Washington. There's a manhunt underway for someone who attacked two guards and robbed an armored delivery truck outside a bank in Edmonton. If you can imagine the big front end loader trucks when they drop their bins, it felt like it, it sounded like it was being dropped from 20 feet. It was very loud. So I think it was a device meant to basically make the guards basically, uh, I don't know, you know, make them 
not able to respond so they can just grab the money and run. I think it was intentional. Police say the suspect set off an explosion to divert the guards. A male and a female guard are in hospital with serious but non-life-threatening injuries. They were in an armored van parked outside the bank. Police say the suspect ran with an undisclosed amount of money. The hunt for a gunman in Strasbourg, France is now over. Authorities confirm police shot and killed the suspect in the Christmas market attack. Alleluia. The French interior minister says police neutralized the assailant during a confrontation with a special brigade. Police had have identified the suspect as 29-year-old Sharif Shakat. He was born in Strasbourg and was on a security watch list. Authorities have blocked off the area where the suspect was killed. And nine people have been killed and dozens more injured in a train derailment in Turkey. A high-speed train hit a locomotive and then crashed into a station platform and overpass. Emergency crews are working to free people from the wreckage. It's not clear what caused the crash or how fast the trains were traveling at the time. Well, being given a cancer diagnosis can be devastating, but what happens when the wrong patient is given the news? A newly released report compiled in Manitoba shows it does happen, and it's probably more common than many people think. The CBC's Marina von Stackelberg has more. In one case, a Manitoba breast cancer patient went under the knife for a lumpectomy, but that person never had cancer. It turns out doctors operated on the wrong person. Staff mixed up the diagnostic tests of two different patients. That means another person who was told they were cancer-free actually had a tumor. In an entirely separate case, a patient was told they did not have breast cancer. But that wasn't true because the tissue samples were mixed up. In a third situation, a patient was treated for the wrong type of cancer. The reason for this mistake? The oncologist wasn't given the right pathology report. All of these incidents, along with two other major errors in cancer care, all happened in a three-month window at the end of 2017. Patient advocates say there could be more incidents that aren't being reported. Of course they concern me because there's people behind them. There's patients, there's families, there's staff, um, and they're tragic. Lori Thompson says the vast majority of times everything goes as planned. CBC News wanted to know how frequent cancer care mix-ups are. We searched through every one of Manitoba Health's incident reports available online, dating back nearly eight years. There were delays in cancer tests and treatment, but we could not find a single case of mixed-up cancer records. This doctor says cancer treatment is very complex, especially when multiple people are making judgment calls. There's always the potential that a fax gets sent to the wrong person, a, uh, a, a name gets switched or, or confused, a number is written down incorrectly, and, and it seems hard to believe that you know something as simple as that could lead to that kind of a terrible outcome. I guess that's why we want to think about how, how can we make multiple systems or multiple checks. The Manitoba Nurses Union says nurses in cancer care are being asked to treat more patients with fewer resources. Cancer Care Manitoba denied our request for an interview. In a statement, it says Cancer Care Manitoba works with all of its partners in looking at the system more broadly, consider what may contribute to incidents when they happen, and look at how to make changes to prevent their recurrence. We also reached out to the Minister of Health, who did not make time for an interview. Marina von Stackelberg, CBC News, Winnipeg. Omar Khadr will have to wait at least another week to find out if an Alberta judge agrees to his request for changes to his bail conditions. The Toronto-born former Guantanamo Bay detainee made the request in an Edmonton courtroom. He's been out on bail since 2015 while he appeals his conviction in the death of a U.S. Army medic, but there's been no movement on hearing that appeal. And that means he remains stuck with bail conditions. Cotter says he's frustrated with the U.S. process and hopes for better things from the Canadian system. This is not the first time my life has been uh, held in suspension. And I'm going to continue to fight this uh, injustice. And thankfully we have, we have an actual court system that has actual rules and laws. Cotter has asked the court to allow him a Canadian passport so he can make a pilgrimage to Mecca. 
He also wants to be able to call his sister without supervision. The Crown disagrees with making changes to the bail conditions. The Alberta judge will rule one week from tomorrow. And one of the most important heritage buildings in the country is closing. Yes, the center block on Parliament Hill in Ottawa is being shut down for a massive renovation and it's expected to take at least 10 years. That's a very That's long time. That's a very time. long time. <laughs> CBC's David Cochran takes us through the delicate and expensive project. It's not the mother of all parliaments, but it's about to undergo the mother of all renovations. I'm going to miss it a lot. I mean, I'm in my anticipatory grieving phase about this building. There are things that I, I still come in and see something new. And As curator, uh, Joanna Mizgala like, uh, is the guardian of the artifacts. Everything from the ceremonial mace to the portraits on the walls to the desks in the house fall under her care. All of it will be moved to the temporary parliament or spend time being restored. Well, it's a huge job. I mean, we've never had an opportunity to um, just turn our attention to the building. So whenever we've been able to do any work on the building, it's been either when the house is not in session or when, during an election period, but never a kind of concentrated effort on the building. Ms. Gala will safeguard the grandeur while others handle the granite on a project with no firm timeline no firm price. At this point, the, the baseline budget or schedule has not been firmly established. The heritage nature of this place makes any renovation difficult and expensive. Among other things, the center block needs to be reinforced to better withstand earthquakes. The biggest challenge is that the renovators won't really know what they are dealing with until they start. The original builders improvised during construction, meaning the work doesn't match the blueprints. What year we will really move back into center block? As soon as possible. Uh, <laughs> While they sort that out, MPs will meet in this temporary House of Commons, built in the west block of the parliamentary precinct. The most optimistic timeline suggests it will be in use for at least three federal election cycles, maybe more. Well, and in fact, you can expect that there will be members of parliament who will be elected who will serve their entire careers and only sit in the temporary chamber in the West Block and never sit in the chamber, you know, the real House of Commons in this building. The idea in these renovations is to strike a balance, to preserve the ornate features of Canada's most important heritage building, but update it for modern times. When the building was built, uh, there were no uh, washrooms for women, for example. Uh, we, that's been changed, obviously, but that should be improved. Uh, there weren't until recently any spaces for doing things like breastfeeding and looking after small children. That will take a long time. By late January, the doors will be closed to the public for at least a decade, almost certainly longer. <laughs> the carillon will still chime each day, at least until 2022, when the bells go silent to be restored. So come hear them while you can. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. Well, space tourism might happen long before the renovations are finished in Ottawa. It took one giant step forward to becoming reality today, coming up the test flight that was out of this world.
I am a basketball player through and through. Love the sport. I play beer league hockey, not very well, but I bring my skates to the rink. I got into journalism really to make a difference in people's lives and to give a voice to people who wouldn't normally have one. Okay, Richard Branson's Virgin Galactic took a long-awaited step of flying its tourism rocket ship to the edge of space. That's right. A test flight brought the dream of commercial space tourism closer to reality. <laughs> the mothership Eve took off from the Mojave Desert today, and at 40,000 feet, it fired off its spacecraft Unity into the great beyond. The two test pilots took the spaceship 82 kilometers above the Earth and officially into space. The Federal Aviation Administration, FAA, will be granting both pilots their commercial astronaut wings. Yes, and the next step for Virgin Galactic is to send paying tourists up into space. About 600 people are already signed up. Price tag? $250,000 a ticket. Not bad. That's nothing. Oh. Okay, money, money aside, <laughs> would you do it? Oh, I think that would be so... Well, I know you'd do yeah. it. That was so cool. Yeah, I mean, can we pitch in, get like 55,000 people to share the cost? And, and then who gets to go? You draw a ticket. That's not a, that's not a bad yeah. idea. Good idea. Would there be beverage service on board as well, do you think? <laughs> yeah, I'll try to work out the details yeah, for exactly. you. Priorities, yeah. right? <laughs> Stay tuned, for real. <laughs> well, thanks so much for watching tonight. You can always find our news program online, cbc.ca slash bc. We're leaving you tonight with some beautiful photos of Grouse Mountain. Mm. It was raining here down below, but of course it was white uh, up there. And I just want to remind you, Mount Seymour opens at 1 o'clock tomorrow. Ooh. So if you're... Skipping work. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we won't tell. Yeah, Have a good here night. at 11. <laughs> good After night. the national.